that's a lot of stuff. But I wanted to uh, go further into some of the things that I left on the board because there wasn't any way to expound on all of it last week. So if you if you would, let's just close our eyes and just kind of get our hearts and mind in a place of receiving, being receptive. Father, we just uh, we praise you. We give you thanks for this beautiful day. We thank you, Father God, for one another. I ask you, Father God, just to open our eyes, open our ears to hear. Help us to peek above and beyond our belief system to see things that we haven't seen before. Stretch us, challenge us, and change us, Father. We give you honor, we give you praise, we give you thanks for it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, you know, I, uh, when, when, as we were kind of talking earlier about our early experiences, everybody had, has, and have your experiences, right? I mean, everybody does, and that's a part of life, and they're, they're not right or wrong. Generally, an experience comes as an, as an educator, but we don't always pay attention to it that way. Sometimes that's a bad experience. I don't do that again. Well, that's an education. That's oh, yeah. teaching you, and that's training you, and that's what experiences are for. And, of course, that word, experience, right? Everybody's had them, right? And, and we will have them, and we continue to have them. We're, we're designed and we're built to have experiences. But the Hebrew word for experience is nachesh. And it's translated in Genesis 3 for the word serpent. And it's a shame that in religion, and also in translation, that they translated it as serpent, and then the stories begin to build and evolve over time through religion to call that serpent a snake. And then they graduated the snake to become Satan or Lucifer or the devil, or the, all the same thing. And so that was gross error. And that's really, that, that, that is a, uh, that is a hurdle that's hard for anybody to get over because we've been inundated with, with religious thoughts and ideas and don't, don't really know that that's what they are, but that's what they are. We've been, all of us have been taught those different things that I just mentioned about Lucifer, mm -hmm. Satan, the devil, and the serpent. Yet, we, you know, we read clearly in John that Jesus said, be wise as the serpent. In other words, he was instructing you and me to observe the serpent and use it as the symbol of wisdom, which in ancient mythology, that's what the serpent was. It was the symbol of wisdom or the symbol of God and knowledge. And so we lost that through religion and kind of dumbing us down and uh, teaching us something completely contrary to that concept because experiences will always give you wisdom from that experience no matter whether you say it's good or bad. <laughs> it, will, it will give you wisdom. So if we had taken Genesis chapter 3 and understood it in a different light of the fact that the serpent was the symbol of experience which is where I get wisdom and I learn knowledge from those different things. And that's what the word nachesh means, means to observe diligently or to pay attention, be aware, mm -hmm. to learn from your experience. It's even translated that way. You know? mm -hmm. But nobody uh, taught us that. Nobody, nobody shared that with us, and so we were, we were kind of stuck. Sometimes they just won't quit and go away. <laughs> so, so I I started early on in my in my studies as a 
seeker of words, just taking any word or a word. It didn't matter to me. I wanted to know where the word come from. What was the etymology? What was the root? What was its original meaning? Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm going to say this in the Bible, in the scriptures <laughs> that we have. I'm using the King James mainly because of its popularity, not, a, not because of its accuracy. It's hard to find an accurate translation. There is not really an accurate translation. They are all tampered with and right. twisted and dumbed down and given us mm -hmm. the ideas that they want us to embrace so that they can put a noose around our neck and lead us where they want us to go. Right. And that's pretty much what's behind those ideas or mistranslations. Mm -hmm. There is no such word as God in the Bible. Wow. <laughs> Take there. As a matter of fact, the word God is a Germanic word that was never used until the late 5th, 6th century. Somewhere between 650 and, uh, 550 and 650, common era. It wasn't used until that time. And it was created, the word was created from German language. It was a dramatic word. And you, anybody, you can look it up. Anybody can Google it and you can find out where it is, what's the etymology of the word God. And that's where it'll take you. So if you go prior to that, if you go prior to 550, 600, if you go back, further back than that, there was no such word as God. It did not exist. So then, <laughs> that puts us in a dilemma. Wow! Because God is the most common word we have in our language, in our vernacular. Especially if you're looking at spiritual material or you're looking at Christianity or Hindu or Buddhism or it doesn't matter. We embrace that word God. And so we have a plethora of meanings when we do. Because if I said God, you don't think the same thing I meant when I said God. Or you said God, I don't think the same thing you meant when you said God. So that really puts us in a dilemma. And so, and I know that, and I used that last week, actually, when I put the Hebrew glyphs that are found, Aleph, Lamed, Hey, Yod, I mean, Hey, Mim. Uh, that's the Hebrew glyphs that we translate in our English translation for the word God. But that word was never singular in Hebrew, never. You go back in ancient Hebrew, it always referred to the first seven signs of the astrological wheel. Always. And if you do gematria on this word, it will, well, I'll just show you. When I'm talking about gematria, because in Hebrew, every glyph has a numeric value. The alif has the value of one, a has the value of five, etc., etc. All the Hebrew glyphs have a numeric value because there is no numbering system in Hebrew. The alphabet and the numbering system are the same. They don't change. So when you have this particular set of glyphs, Alif, Lamid, Alif has a value of 1, Lamid has a value of 30, Hay has a value of 5, Yod has a value of 10 and mil has a value this is the final mil has a value of 600 so when you do your mantra here's what you do you take each one of the glyphs you add them together and then you reduce them to their lowest number that will give you the idea of what that word refers to now I want you to see this and this is I mean you can't debunk this you can try <laughs> But no matter what you do, it is what it is. So you have 610 and 15 and 30 is 45, right? Is that right? Yep. 630, 45, and 1 is 46, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be how much? 646. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Right. Yeah. 6 and 4 is 10, and 6 is 16, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then six and one, add them together is what? Seven. Seven. So that word, Elohim, is referring to the first 
seven signs in the astrological wheel, period. And all of these seven signs are, according to ancient Hebrew, the building blocks of the character called Adam Kibman, which actually, when you break it down, it means the God-man in the sky, which comes from Hermetic philosophy, which simply says, as above, so below, as without, so within. So it's trying to tell us that our abdomen, from our head to our sex organ, is built by the power of the astrological wheels, which we call gods, with an S. So, that's how ancient Hebrew and Gematria works. So there was no such word as God prior to the Germanic language, the German language, and we they created that word God because if you went to Hindu, you had the word Allah. Uh, if you went to Zoroaster, you had Shambhala. And they weren't, none of those names were wrong. They were all names trying to give us an idea of the energy of the astrological wheel or, or of astrology or the Maseroth. That's how it's called that different things in scripture. And it wasn't that it was wrong or right, it was that it was and is the creator of all things. See, there's nothing would be on this earth if it wasn't for that astrological wheel. The sun, the moon, and the stars. They are the creators of everything going on here. So it's hard for us to grasp that kind of ideology because we, uh, we've just been taught that God is our Father. And that's true, but it's truer in a deeper sense than how we think of it because the way we're taught to think of it is in a fleshly, carnal, natural sense. But if we thought of it beyond that ideology, if we thought of it as though it were a supreme, yes. be, not being, but a supreme intelligence. Because when you take the word Elohim, uh, it, uh, it, it not only is referring to something that's omnipresent, right, go omni. In other words, it's present everywhere, all at the same time. So there's nowhere that its presence is not. Now you have to think that that could not be anything in a human form. Because you can't be. You're present here because you are, you're limited to your human form. But when you say that this Elohim is omnipresent, that means it's present everywhere all at the same time. And then we have another word, we call it omnipotent. What does that mean? That just simply means it's all powerful everywhere it's at. So there's nowhere that it's not at that it's not powerful. So there again, that reduces it or takes it out of, it doesn't reduce it, but it takes it out of a reduced form. So it can't, so when you say that word, you can't, if you put in an idea of an old white, a white headed, white bearded old man, then we will never get out of what we're locked into. And my, my whole effort, my energy is in helping you and me get out of the box that we've been locked into that are ideologies that keep us stuck. And we want to get, I want to get unstuck. I want to get free. I want to, I want to be all that I have been built and designed to be. And I'm sure something in you says, there is more. And there is a lot more. You know, I, I have abilities that I'm not tapping into even though I have them. I have a potential, a potency that's deeper in me that will help me, that will encourage me, that will strengthen me. Those are omniscient, omno, omnipotent. That will get me beyond that. And then we have we have the knowing of God as He's 
omniscient, which just simply means he's all-knowing. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that this energy doesn't know. It knows everything, so it's extremely intelligent. Mm -hmm. Now, if we put those, and we begin to realize, wow, that, that concept of that idea is not only surrounding me all the time, that is also within me all the time. Because of the aphorism that they had, as above, so below, as without, so within. And yet we, we kind of put ourselves in the shells. It's not me. <laughs> oh, yes, it is. <laughs> it is in you. It's up to you to go in there and tap it and get into it. Because, and, and I realized that the things that I would share and teach is so out of the box of the traditional norm, and I, and I do know it, and I do understand that it is, I, I'm not doing it because I'm just trying to be different at all. It's, not like, it's just that I see something that I know that every one of us, once we see it, it's going to start to transform you. It's going to raise you out of your belief box into a place and a position where yes. you'll begin to see as God sees. Unlimited. Yes. All-powerful. And that's how you built and designed. Our problem has been we only have cultivated one aspect of our being and that aspect of our being that we've cultivated has taken control of our being. Mm -hmm. And that aspect of our being is our human being. Mm -hmm. Our Adam being. Mm -hmm. That's this yes. character right here. Humanity. Our mankind being. And that mm -hmm. mankind being has taken control over me through my sensual apparatus. Mm -hmm. What I see, smell, taste, touch, and hear. Right. And it's taken control and it's in charge of me. And we all know it, but don't want to admit it. <laughs> but it, God gave that for you and me, not to control you and me, but to serve you and me. It's supposed to be your servant. Instead, we've made ourselves its servant. Right. And how to reverse that? How do we turn that around? Well, first of all, we have to see ourselves as all powerful because it is the all powerful one that's in me. So, you know, and so the things that in the Scripture are written in such a way that it's so difficult to see it, are translated down. That's what's happened. It's been translated down that it's hard to see it from the transcript we've been given because there's so much added to the transcript. I mean, you know, like for instance, if you read, and it's not an easy read, it's a very, very difficult read. If you read the Cipher of Genesis by Carlos Soares, you will struggle through that. It's a difficult read. I, I don't care what level of education you've got. It's a difficult read. And part of the reason that it's so difficult is because we've been so dumbed down. Mm -hmm. It's hard to think that way. It's hard to think the way God created you to be. Mm -hmm. Because God created you to be all-powerful. God created you to be the Enosh. How many of you had ever heard of that? Enosh. Here it is. It's hard. Psalms 8. When God says, I've given you dominion, I've given you power over everything, over all of the creation, I've given that to you. It's hard to, it's hard to grasp that, isn't it? Yes. Well, I ain't got none of it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't use it. It's not working for me. Well, see, the reason that you say that is because you're going back to your physical, natural, uh, carnal person that's in charge of your life. You know, if you get beyond that and realize that, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be in charge. You're supposed to be the one serving and enjoying this. Mm -hmm. So, so I, and I know that, but I know that, that I, I know because I never knew that all of these different Hebrew names were translated by our one English word, either Adam or man. Mm -hmm. And when I would hear the word man, I was just thinking of the male species that God must have created first. <laughs> I mean, why, what gives you that idea? Why do you think God had to create a man first? I, if you think about it, it's just the other way around. Why not create a woman first? Because it's only she who can promote the, the race. So why not make her first? And then make a man to fit her. Makes more sense to me. 
<laughs> but but we got it the other way around. He made man first, and then he made a woman to fit him. Mm -hmm. And so now then we are we have a patriarchal society which thinks we're in charge if we have a if we're a male. <laughs> if we have man attributes. When if we realize that that word never meant was not a, it was not a personal pronoun. It was not a noun referring to a person, the first uh, prototype or the first human type being. It was referring to all of mankind. And I know I said something last last week, and I said, and I got this actually from Alan Watts because Alan Watts he I, li I used to listen to him a lot years ago, and I still enjoy him. But that was he was. He was a, like a teacher to me 20, 30 years ago, and I enjoy his stuff. And so he was, I think he was an Episcopalian priest, and he went to India to do mission work. And he, it, when he got to India, he's the one that got missionized. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new word I made up. It's in the Lynn Hayes Dictionary, buddy. <laughs> and so what happened to him when he went over there, and it happened to many, many people. I, I've read quite a few books by Brunton. If you ever heard of uh, Brunton, Brunton wrote a whole series of books who was a singular type guy, went over to India to do mission work, and then they wound up <laughs> becoming converted themselves and began to see much further out of their box of Christianity. So that's what happened to Alan Watts. And so he had this phrase that he said, and he, I don't know if he coined this, but he's the one I heard say it. He said, have you ever thought how and why an apple tree apples? And, and you know, just by saying it, I thought, wow, it does. No, <laughs> apple tree apples, that's, that's what it's designed to do. And, I, you know, you think about that. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the apple tree is designed to grow up in apple. And that's what it does. It just grows up and it apples. The apples just, they're there. And he said, well, the earth is designed to people. And he said that. I heard him say that. Boy, I mean, bells went off all kinds of ways. What? The earth is designed to people. And so if you look at that and you think, wow, well, if you're, if you're European, it looks like that, that Europeans, somehow or another, it peopled a people who were are Celtic, some of the further northern, it peopled a race of people who were Caucasian. Or if you go back to Africa, it peopled a people who were of darker skin. Or if you go out to the east, it peopled a people who are of a different nature of skin. Or go to American Indian, and you, when you start to see that and you start to embrace it, wow, so God can cause the earth to people just exactly like he can cause an apple tree to apple. And you start to think about that. Then you realize that Adam and Eve's kids didn't have to go somewhere and marry their sister to populate the earth and create all of us through incest. That's, hey, that's out of the box thinking right there. And it's hard to get out of that box to think that way. But it's really hard for you to stay in your box and make your box work and you know it because it don't work because it don't make sense. It does not make any sense whatsoever. Why would an intelligent creator figure have to do it in such a way that it would cause all of us to be a part of an incestual marriage and propagate the whole earth through that kind of ideology? And that's exactly what your ideology is. If you're going with the ideology that Genesis 1, 2, 3 created a man called Adam and a woman called Eve and from them populated the whole earth. And that's a sad note to be in. But for me to say that's not what the story's all about, that's hard. So it's hard for you to climb up out of your brain box and say, well, peep over and say, well, maybe it's different. And then Noah's family did it all over again. Exactly, yeah. Then you have eight, knowing his wife and his three sons and their wives who started it out in a drunken state. Mm -hmm. That's right. Hallelujah. That's right. So let's all go get drunk. That's how Noah started the thing all over again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you, go, if you go and realize that those are fabulous stories that aren't about historical people, they are fabulous stories that's telling me about the attributes of my own being. That it tells me that I am a Noah. 
that I have Noahic attributes. It tells me that I am a Jacob, that I have this Jacob surplanter, deceiver attribute. That's a part of my carnality. That's a part of my mortality. That's a part of my Enosh man. But when I, and I start to see that, I start to embrace that, it starts to raise me up out of the limitations of my box that I've been in. And so, and I, and I know that the, the things that sometimes I'm trying to share are some things that I'm trying to say about these different words. And, and these words, when you do gematria on these words, you, get, you come up with the lowest number value of each word. It gives you an idea of what that word is and where that word fits in the pattern or the plan. See, these first nine glyphs, which are single characters, refer to the plan, the pattern, the idea that's behind the intelligence that we call God. And then when you come to the second row of glyphs in Hebrew, which is 10 through 900, it gives you the manifestation of that idea. If, if it's just an idea, it's not real. But everybody thinks that the idea is the real and the manifestation is only an illusion. It's some type of a temporal expression of something that's not real. It's, it's wanting to go back to the idea. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I kind of like this manifestation that I say is the real, th this is the real deal because it's the manifestation even though it's trying to take me to the third row of Hebrew glyphs which I don't have up which starts out at 100 and goes through 900. And they take me full circle. In other words, they bring not only my humanity which is the tension between my male and female that I, that no matter if I'm a man or a woman, I still have the tension between my masculine and feminine. That's this part right here. That's the brain, the upper brain, with its 12 paired cranial nerves, and that's the Esh and the Esha, which were wed in Genesis 2. That's what God wed. You, you know, I know that really throws everybody a curve when I say there's not no Eve in Genesis 2. And there's not. I mean, there is no Eve in Genesis 2. You say, yeah, but brother then there is the woman and the wife. And that's the same exact word as Esha, which actually just simply means it's the feminine side of your brain that is that side of the brain that will incubate the idea from the masculine side of your brain and create that idea into reality. Every one of us live that way. Every one of us function that way and don't even know that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And go back to the book of Proverbs. You read it. As you think, if you constantly think about it, you constantly think about it, so you will be. It just becomes that. I mean, that, and that's powerful. You think yourself weak, you will be weak. Mm -hmm. You think yourself powerless, you'll, you, you'll be powerless. Mm -hmm. You think yourself sick, you'll get sick. But if you think yourself just the other way, you think that you're all powerful, you become all powerful. If you think you're well, if you think you're healthy, you know what you'll start to do? You'll start to do things in your body that will that will tend toward being healthy. Really, I don't do that. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I'm saying that tongue in cheek because I enjoy food. I have a very broad palate. I haven't found the food and I'm not sure that I don't like. <laughs> so I can... So I do enjoy the, the flesh appetites and the food. So I, I'm saying all these things about the Eash and the Easha in Genesis chapter 2 because I know that is, that is just something that's unheard of in Christianity. They've never heard of that because they've been so ingrained in Genesis 2 where God took Adam and Eve and God did a marriage ceremony and said, I pronounce you man and wife. Nobody can pull you asunder. And it wasn't saying that. It never, ever said that. If you go back and look at it in ancient Hebrew, it was referring to the building of the physical body, which is the temple, the tabernacle, the house, the home where Elohim lives. Hallelujah.
And He lives it in and through you. No matter who you are, where you are, what prayer you prayed, or what prayer you hadn't prayed, didn't even know that there was a prayer. <laughs> didn't even know you was an old sinner and needed saved by grace. It has nothing to do with any of those things whatsoever. God chose you because God built you because God loves you, period. <laughs> the end, over and out. Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah. I think that's wonderful. Amen. So when we look at the word God in the scriptures that's used hundreds, even thousands of times, it's used from several different words out of the Hebrew, for instance, the word Elohim, also the word El, which is the Alif, Lamia, just that part right there. And if you take this part right here, Alif, Lamid, you would have 30 and 1, so you would have 30 and 1, which would equal 4. And so El just simply means power, is the power to take the four cardinal energies of this dimension and create from it. Which is the same thing with Elohim. I mean, I mean Jehovah. yod heh vav -Hey. So when you're looking at the four, you're talking about the four building blocks of the physical body. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Those are the major building blocks that build it. And that's exactly what that word means. But yet it's called God. Because it is that that builds the physical body. Your body, my body, anybody's body. Don't matter what color the melon in their skin is, it, uh, they're, still, they're still built and they're still that part. So, uh, said a lot here. I want to say some things now that's even harder to say than what I said. So that's difficult. But I want you to see this, and you, you all remember this story. If you want to go with me to Romans chapter... Eight. Romans chapter 8 and, and this is you just have to kind of buckle your seatbelt hang in there tight we go through this Romans I, I would say this and I, I'll, I will say this That the Apostle Paul, you know, it's like I have done exegesis on many, if, I mean, many, many of the books of the Bible over the last 40 something years. I took six months and exegeted the whole book of, of Job, took almost a year and exegeted the book of Ezekiel, took almost a year and exegeted the book of Revelation. I used to do that on Wednesday night Bible studies. I would take a book and I would just go through that book and do the, an exegesis of that whole book and break that whole book down and try to say here's the concept of the means behind these books. And so in doing that it broadened my vision and understanding in the putting together of this book and I began to realize if I don't understand like the book of the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians, I did an exegesis on 1 Corinthians. If I don't realize that that book is divided into two sections, it's divided in the first six chapters to what the, what the pagans, which were the common folks, believed from their religious ideologies. And most all of the Christians were pagans. And, and we have been told a pagan was a godless person. That's not true. But pagans were country folks. They were just country dwellers. They weren't city people. They didn't live in the city. They lived in the country. But many of the people in the city embraced the pagan ideologies, which were common ideologies. And so Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, first to the pagan or Christian community, which was built out of the Essene churches. And the Essenes were people who had left from all different groupings of people and moved out to live and kind of live a, alone or different you know and they were they were embraced with all kinds of ideas and they their ideology was the Christ was was the truth of the Savior 
the Christ, which was an oil that flows in your physical body, and that's how they taught it, and that's how they understood it. And I'm talking about 354 to 400 years before the story of Jesus come along. I'm going back 3, 360 to 400 with the ASEAN community. All of this that I'm saying, you can Google it or you can look it up or you can research it and study and see that what I'm telling you is happening. So when Paul wrote the book of Romans, it's wrote in two sec sections, just exactly like 1 Corinthians is wrote in two sections. 1 Corinthians wrote the first six sections for six chapters. The first section of 1 Corinthians is where Paul is looking and examining the things of the uh, pagan Christian community, which they were having, some of, them, some of the community was having, sons-in-law was having sex with their mothers-in-law. They were doing that. And they called themselves Christians. Now, what you couldn't, you, well, a lot of people could get away with that. I mean, uh, a lot of people have. They've done that and called that. But then, in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, now I'm going to tell you what the spiritual side of this is. That's the truth of all things. Because there is a physical carnal side that's not right or wrong that will produce what it will produce. It will produce chaos. It will produce sickness and disease. It will produce things that you won't, won't be glad when they come. <laughs> you say, oh no, I didn't want that. Well, I'm sorry you produced it. You brought it to yourself. You can't blame any of all the devil did it. Well, you know, that's our greatest. We need an excuse, right? Mm -hmm. Well, see, that's the carnal natural man. First six chapters are about the carnal natural man in 1 Corinthians. And then the rest of the last eight or nine chapters are about the spiritual man. See, because you are both body and psyche. You are both natural and spiritual. You are both human and divine. You're not one without the other. Ain't a song about that, ain't it? <laughs> you can't have one without the other. You can't. See, you can't just have the body and not have the spirit. You can't just have the spirit and not have a body. If, it's the, if you have just the one without the other, you don't have nothing. That's why God in some religions is called the great no-thingness. <laughs> why? Because that's what it is. If it's just the idea, if that's all it is, if it's just the idea, tomorrow it'll be a different idea, it'll never be real, it'll never be manifest. The manifest is what is the real. The manifest is the idea fleshed out. So you can't have one without the other. So I'm telling you all this, the book of Romans is written the same way. It's written with the first seven chapters, and it ends like this at the end of the seventh chapter. If you just look at it with me, verse 24. This is every one of us's prayer, or every one of us's statement. I don't care who we are. The first three words are what? Romans chapter 7, verse 24. Oh, man. I'm a wreck. Oh man, I'm a wreck. That's our story. Every one of us. This is my story. This is my song. I'm just a wreck and I'm all alone. <laughs> I mean, that's it. We live and die that way. And, and, God, and God said, it ain't, no, it never was designed. I never built it to be that way. You, you destroy yourself by the power that will create yourself. Yeah. Because God empowers you, really. Mm -hmm. God empowers you, and so we use the power in the wrong way, and that power that we use in the wrong way makes me an old wretched man. Mm -hmm. Look at what he said. He said, oh God, oh wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin and death. With the mind, in other words, the psyche, that's the spiritual aspect of my being. If I can tap into it, I can cultivate it, I can develop it, it can begin to take control over my physical wreck 
side of my being that I have really screwed up. And then chapter 8 starts a whole new story, and this story is based off the spiritual side of it. He said, with my body I serve the law of sin and death, but with my spirit I serve the law of life. Now, they have added words to a lot of this, which that's fine. I don't have any problem with the words they added. Like the word Jesus is added most of the places that's added there. But Jesus and the story of Jesus is the most fabulous story that's ever been told if you understand the story correctly. Because the story of Jesus is the story of you because Jesus and its story is your story. It's how that you come and die this death on the cross of the physical matter. That's your physical body. So that you can be raised up and by the power of the Christ, the oil that's inside you so that you can be the divine man, the resurrected man in this physical body. So, so I, I'm not making light of that story. I actually embrace that story in its true significance because it was the story that was told in, uh, in uh, the Greek with the story of a man called Dionysus. Same story, but his name was Dionysus. It's the same story that was told in Egypt far, far years, way superior to the story of Jesus or Dionysus and it was Horus. I think I talked about it week before last. Horus, the eye of Horus. It's all over the Egyptian mythology because when you have the eye of Horus, you have raised up in your being the spiritual power of your being to, to be what God's called you and designed you to be. So, when I, you know, if I live, I'm just, I'm just the wreck of a man. You know what I'm saying? I've got this habit and I can't kick it. And so since I've got this habit and I can't kick it, now I can say it's an addiction because now it's done a chemical thing in my psyche to set off certain things in my psyche that I think I can't overcome. That's the lack of teaching of who and what you really are because you are God manifested in the flesh. And if you take a hold of that, if you begin to embrace that, if you begin to, 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 to live that and be that, you begin to I am all powerful. There's nothing that I can't kick or break or whatever. So go into chapter 8. And I want you to come down to verse 20 because it, I know I'm saying a lot of things. And I know I can hear it just sometimes it just it just goes in and out. I don't want it to go. I'd like for it to stick in there somewhere and you have to think about it. <laughs> verse 20, it says, For the creature was made subject to vanity. I just want you to hold on to that. Why in the world would God create you and me and then make us the subject of vanity? I think that's a good question. Why would that happen? Why would God create you and me and then make us the subject of vanity? And what does He mean by vanity? What does He mean by that? I mean... You know, I don't know if they amplify amplifies on that word vanity, but actually the word just simply means useless. I don't know if, if the amplified does say that or not, but uh, does it? no. That's what the word vanity means. It means like I'm useless. Yeah. I'm powerless. That's frailty. Frailty. There's you another. Frailty good. There you go. I'm frail. Utility condemned to frustration. Utility. There you go. Well, all you got to do is just look up the word util or utility. Just look it up. See, what does it mean? Actually, the definition of it is, number one, useless. <laughs> Why would God do that? Because, you see, God sees the potential that it put in you, and it puts you in this place that can be paradise and hell at the same time. And that's exactly the truth. Because this place will kill you or live you. That's right. It will. If you go far enough up north and you don't know how to take care of yourself, you're going to freeze to death this winter and it'll kill you. Mm -hmm. Or if you go far enough down south and you don't know how to take care of yourself, you can get, kill yourself through heat exhaustion. Mm -hmm. So right here you are in this place and you seem useless. 
and you seem futile. You do. You seem powerful. The reason we are is because we have been dumbed down spiritually. Because we have not embraced who we are spiritually. Because you are God manifested in the flesh. You are power. <laughs> and you take that power and use that power against yourself because we don't understand it. Because we've taken this marvelous, beautiful book and through the manipulation of translation, <laughs> and I realize it's, you know, it's so difficult to go in here and try to unravel so much of the twisting of the story or adding to it or taking away from it. So I want you to look at that verse with me again, verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected him in hope. Why? Because God subjected you to this in the hope of the fact that you would come to a place where you realize and you recognize who you were, who you are, and what your position here is. Mm -hmm. Your position here is to take this wilderness and make it a garden, a paradise. That's your position. You're supposed to take a piece of chaotic whatever it is, and turn it into something that's organized. That's your position. That's your authority. That's your power. But what do we do? <laughs> we succumb to the mess. Mm -hmm. there you go. We, we, we succumb to the futility. We succumb to the chaos. Mm -hmm. And then we surrender ourselves under it. No. You know, the things that they did to us through this... Uh, Masks they made us wear for the last couple of years, or at least tried to make people wear. The thing that they did to us through that whole concept and idea was just to show us how all they've got to do is put enough stuff in our eyes and ears, and they will deceive us and lead us around with a ring in our nose, just like you lead a hog around with a ring in his nose. They proved that. Why? Because we do not have the gut or we don't have the ability to think out of that box and realize, wait a minute, God created me more powerful than that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, what well, Jesus was, but I ain't. <laughs> no, if Jesus was, you are. That's right. Matter of fact, I think the end of his story says he came and defeated the works of the devil. Mm -hmm. Huh? Yeah. I never heard that. I think the end of the story was as I, as I have been victor, so you are supposed to be the victor. As I have overcome, so you can sit down as an overcomer. I, thought, I think that's how the story wounds up. And that's not in some place out yonder in the sky in the by and by. That's right now. That's, that's the, the whole purpose and design of this thing right now. So look at verse 20 again. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the thing in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of the corruption into the glorious liberty as the children of God. And so he says, I think he goes, on, he goes on and he says in verse 19, he says, the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestations of the sons of God. Mm -hmm. The whole creation is waiting on you and me to stand up and say, I am the manifestation of God in the earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember 40, 50 years ago, there was a guy that went around preaching that manifestation of the sons of God and I didn't know him. It was before my time. His name was Bill Britton, and I think he wrote some pamphlets and stuff. But through my own study and research, I was beginning to say the same things that he had said, even though he had preached the message. It became pretty popular, and he died. And then after he died, someone gave me a cassette. Matter of fact, they gave me two cassettes by, by Bill Britton. And I listened to them, and I thought, wow, this guy's really on to something. I wanted to meet him. I didn't know he was dead. He'd already gone on, graduated, because he was preaching that the whole earth is waiting, it's groaning, it's waiting on the sons of God to manifest, to stand up and be who we be. Well, I say hallelujah, we're here. Amen. Stand up. And that's exactly what I'm thinking Bill Britton was doing, and, and there was a movement that got squelched and got trashed, and a lot of people called it things it wasn't, because they didn't understand it. That's the same thing they do about me. That's the same thing they say about me. So I said that, and I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 3. 
in closing, and this is a, I'll close it leaving you asking questions. All right. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll be asking all kinds of questions. Hallelujah. So, Genesis chapter 2 is not about Adam and Eve. It's not even mentioned there. So, you ask them, where does Eve come in the picture at? She don't come in the picture until the end of the third chapter. And she only comes in the picture one time at the end of the third chapter and one time at the beginning of the fourth chapter and that's it for her. She's done. Twice. Two times. Mm -hmm. Old Testament. And then she's requoted in the New Testament two times. And that's it. You would think that someone that should be as important as Eve, there would be a lot more said about her. Yeah. And there's not. Very little said about her. Very little at all. As a matter of fact, what's said about her appears to be in the English translation bad. Because <laughs> it looks like that God said, well now you did that, I'm going to fix you really good. And so women ever since that have been really fixed good. They think that they're weak. They think they're frail. They think that they're this and they're that. And after all, besides that, God cursed them and said, you ain't going to get nowhere because every time you buy a child, you're going to scream and cry out for help. It's going to be so painful like it wasn't before. I mean, really? <laughs> it may be designed to be that way. It looks like to me it would. It's like trying to pull a watermelon through a keyhole. <laughs> I mean, I know, I saw six, seven of my grandkids born. I thought, dear God, <laughs> how could that be? I See, I had a better view of it than the mother that's pushing it out. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. Yeah, yeah, you think, oh, God, this is horrible. And, uh, and it's not. It's, it's marvelous. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's beyond description of the, of, you know, a brand new God being born in the earth. It just, it's just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing is most of our ideas are out of false translations. For instance, let's go to Genesis 3. and then, Again, I'm just going to provoke some ideas. I'll have to expound on these a lot next week. Mm -hmm. But I want to provoke the ideas anyway. So look in, look in Genesis chapter 3 and look at verse 17. And it says unto, unto mankind, that's the word Adam, that's mankind, Genesis 3, 17, and unto, he said, because you have hearkened unto the, unto the voice of your wife, that is Esha, that's the, the side of your brain that takes the, the idea and incubates it and creates it. Because you've hearkened unto the voice of your wife, and every bit of this, I, let me just stop and say this right here, Every bit of this in the translation is corrupted beyond its description. In other words, there are words added to it, entire sentences added to it to change the complete meaning of what it really says in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Completely. So I want to do the best I can with this English translation, but just by telling you the meanings of these words and let you work out some of it yourself, and then next week I'll try to work out some of it with you. Eash, uh, he says unto you, the voice of your wife, that's Esha, that's not the word Eve. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -mm -mm. and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you will not eat of, the, of it cursed. Now that's the word I want you to look at. This is the second time it's used in the Bible, cursed. And I'm going to... Uh, I ain't got any more to put it. I'm going to put it on the board over here uh, in Hebrew at the bottom right here. I ain't got much room, so I'm going to do it kind of small. That's the word cursed. Cursed. And it's a leaf, a rash, and rash. The rash has a 200 value. It means fire. And any time you see a word that has two glyphs next to each other, you really have to pay attention to it 
because it's fixing to say something that seems like a contradiction. If you don't pay attention to it, you will miss the contradiction. And it's used like when God would say, I will call this that. You get confused and you don't realize that when God does that, God, it sounds like a complete contradiction, but it's used about five times up until you get to the word curse. It's used in Genesis 1, 5, 10, it's used twice in 10, uh, several places where it's in God called, and then he'll say what he called, because it's, the energy is saying, look, this appears to be this way, but it's also this way. In other words, <clears throat> That's a battery. It appears to be one way when it's another way. This side will give you an arc, fire. This side will give you nothing. So it seems like you think, well, that's a contradiction in terms. It really is. It really is. It's just exactly like this right here. This is sunrise. And this is sunset. This is light. And this is dark. And if you look at them closely, they're exactly the same. On the same wheel. Contradictions. Day, night. You see what I'm saying? It's, it, so when you see that word and you see two clips back to back, and they're not they're not a lot of but every now and then you pay attention to it and you realize, wait a minute. So what does this word curse mean? Well, what does this mean between a battery post that's positive and negative? It means if you know how to work these two, you can create a tension that's filled with power. But there is no power without the tension. Now think about that. It's just exactly like this picture that I have right here on the wall. This is the seed. And this seed is only born in attention. What is that tension? That tension is part of it's pulling me down and part of it's pulling me up. You're in that tension right now because there is a part of you that's earthy, that's fleshly, that pulls you down, that grounds you. There's another part of you that's divine, that's spiritual, that's pulling you up. And you say, oh, I've been stretched. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly what that word right there means, cursed. You are put now in a place of tension. What is the tension? The tension is between life and death. Is that a bad thing? That is a good thing. That is the only place that anything in the earth can cha'iva. What does that mean? That is the word cha'iva translated from the word Eve, which means the mother of living. That's all it means. It means it's only in the tension of a curse can anything be alive. You're living it right now. Because you're living between the contrast of your lungs shrinking and expanding. Your heart shrinking and expanding. That's the tension that keeps you going. And so the only place that Eve is mentioned, and she actually, her, her name comes from the root of the word in Genesis 2.9. In Genesis 2.9, out of the ground the Lord God made everything to grow, but every tree that's pleasant to the sight and, every, and good for food, the tree of life, Che. Eve's name is Cha'iva. Shade. The root of Eve's name comes from life. Because that's what God is. God is the life that lives you. If you didn't have that. And so when we read the word curse right here, there's three words in Hebrew that are what I would call kindred words. Genesis 1, 5, where it says, let there be light, and God is light. That's or. And that word is spelled like this. Olive. 
That's light. So light is the root word for curse. Because it's only the light that pours itself into the ground, the negative of tension, that pulls and causes that tension for life to come about. And then there is this word. And it has to do with spelled just exactly like that, but it has this on the end of it. The tot. And this is called A-R-R-A. Aret. Aret's not the name. We made it the name of something because we took it. Aret means it's a place in time where you are given a fresh start. That's what it means in Hebrew. A place in time. You know when that, where that place is at? Every moment you're taking a breath. Every moment you're taking a breath, you are at a place in time where you can have a fresh start. No matter who you are or where you're at. And you're there right now. And that fresh start would just simply be what you will take in and incubate and what you will decide that you want to refuse and, and reject. Okay, now I know that drops a bomb on you, don't you? But you can see the spelling of all these. They all come from the root word light or olive rash. They come from that word. Curse comes from this root word, which actually means tension. That's a better word for it. If it's been translated that way, tension, it's in tension that you live. And then Ararat, again, we talked about it's Noah. That's where Noah got his fresh start. Was at that place. In time. Got a brand new beginning. Yeah. So, okay, we'll stop right there and...